Hello and welcome back, Royal Family. Got another funky day down here. <laughs> 6623. June 6, Year of Our Lord 2023 is your date. We will jump right into it. I don't have a lot of announcements. We're going to keep the same folks in prayer. We're going to move forward. We're going to pray for everything going on in the world. Uh, keep me in prayer as well. I got a little touch of skin cancer there, it looks like. And the uh, doctor tried to burn it about a week ago, like frost it out. And uh, it's, it's healing, but I might have to go in and have it like scraped. So keep me in prayer. It doesn't look like a major issue. But as we get older, we have to pay attention to a lot of little marks and moles and things that happen. And I'm very light-skinned, obviously, uh, being predominantly uh, Irish and French, <laughs> little Scottish and supposedly some Native, Native American in there, but who knows. Um, so I got to keep an eye on that. Once a year, I go get checked all my skins and moles and all the different things you have on your backs and your arm and all that. And that area was a little funky for a while, so he burned it. He, like, frosted it last week. And uh, I got to go back in for that, to have that examined and probably shaved or whatever. It is what it is. So keep me in prayer. Plenty to pray for. Having said that, we're going to jump right into it. I don't have a lot of announcements. Today's lesson is the Bride of Christ Seeks Her Wedding Ceremony. The Bride of Christ Seeks Her Wedding Ceremony is your title. It is 1 Thessalonians Lesson 96. Message 96 of our study of 1 Thessalonians. Let's get ready to jump into it, do the most important thing we do, which is what? Get into the Word filled with the Spirit, because in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And like newborn babes, long for that pure milk of the Word, so that by it you may grow, I may grow, we all grow in respect to our salvation by taking in the Word of God, being filled with God the Holy Spirit, the power, not the indwelling, different than indwelling, power of God the Holy Spirit that opens up Christ, our Christ-like nature, new nature, and we can absorb the Word. You simply name and cite any known sins, believers, and you wash yourself clean. It's not complicated. God made His grace abundant plan so abundantly easy on top of being abundantly grace. So easy. First John 1, 8, 9, and 10. Believers, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. First John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, believers, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, cleansing us from all unrighteousness. First John 1, 8 says, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. His word is not in us. Let's take a moment of silent prayer. Keep everyone and everything in prayer, name and sight, any known sins first and foremost. Get rid of the garbage and distractions secondary. And thirdly, we will keep everything in prayer. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we have to come and study your word. And Father, we're lifting up the people we've been praying for recently, keeping them in our prayers, keeping them in our thoughts, and praying as unity, as a small congregation, a positive pivot of believers, a remnant of believers still left here before the rapture, that are praying together, that are moving forward together, that are growing together. Father, we have that unity in mind, one mind, the mind of Christ working in us. In all our unique personalities, we are in a unity with Christ's mind in our new nature. That we reflect Christ even in our unique personalities that you have given us, God. It's phenomenal. We are grateful for that. And we are moving forward in unity and prayer and growing. Father, we're also praying for all the lost and dying world out there that is pushing away from your truth and your word. The unbelievers that keep rejecting the gospel. Father, we're knocking again on their hearts and asking you. Present the gospel another time, another time to them. Those in our periphery that have drifted away from the truth or will not accept the truth of Jesus Christ. Father, we're praying for all these people. We're praying for our, our media. We're praying for our president who seems to be confused and lost and has medical issues, Father. We don't, whether we agree with our, our leaders or not, we have to pray for them. Father, we're praying even for our media who's been a a liar and habitual deceiver for, for, for many years. We're praying for them that they'll 
straighten out, Father, and come forward and shine the light. We're praying for our military leaders, whether they've been positive or negative, Father, that they can go forward and make the right decisions. We're praying for peace across the world. We're praying for truth so we can move forward because we know the end times are rapidly approaching, Father. We're praying for all of these things through your Son's precious name. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Let's jump into it. The bride, the bride of Christ seeks her wedding ceremony. We should be seeking it. We should have an eye or a view towards going home to be with the Lord face to face. Not morbid, like, oh, I want to die tomorrow. That's not what I'm saying. I never teach that. Because you are to participate and be active in your temporal life here as a soldier in combat, as an ambassador, a representative of heaven, and as a believer priest moving forward. But we have a view or an eye, we would say, in the back of our mind that is always looking forward to the time that we can go up in the rapture. That's what I'm telling you. It is not a morbid mentality of, oh, let me die now. I can't handle this. That's weakness. That's different. Our recent study about the rapture of the church has touched on the aspect of the unique calling of this dispensation, church age, a uniqueness, especially in relation to marriage. I think you've seen that now in the last lesson going into this one. We'll highlight it a little more. We will go into Ephesians chapter 5. Go to Ephesians chapter 5 today, please. So open up there. I want to give a very straightforward message that ensures you understand you are the bride of Christ today. That's where I feel the Spirit's leading me. Because we're going to get ready to jump back into 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, wrap it up and complete it. So I want to go straightforward message today, give you a lot of scriptures that you can rely on and look at. Don't have to tear them apart too much. They're really, they're really pretty self-explanatory. But that speak to the fact that part of mystery doctrine is our intimacy with Christ in this church age is a marriage. You are the bride of Christ. You will believe that by the end of today, I would hope so. The words of Jesus himself, when he walked on the earth in his earthly ministry, the words of Jesus himself referenced a unique union related to marriage for the church age dispensation we live in. Matthew 9.14, I'm going to put on the board. In fact, Matthew 9.14 and 15, he speaks on this exact subject matter in a way that has... Um, dispensations in it if you understand what dispensation you live in and what was happening at the time of the doctrine of the hypostatic union was active on the earth. Matthew 9 14 then the disciples of John came to him asking why do we and the Pharisees fast but you your disciples do not fast and look who answers. Jesus heard this Matthew 9 15 and Jesus said to them the attendants of the groom cannot mourn as long as the groom is with them. He's referencing himself. Can they? But the days will come. Not here yet. In fact, the wedding's not even here yet. But I'm just letting you know. He's using an example. But the days will come when the groom is taken away from them. And then they will fast. Remember, fasting has a lot to do with getting your focus right. If something's happened in your life, fasting is no, not always about food. I've taught you that before. It's misinterpreted a lot. It has to do with getting your focus in order. Fasting itself doesn't bring you closer to God. Oh, because if I fast now, I'm going to get closer to God. That's putting your flesh in it. Fasting has to do with getting rid of all the distractions and the fancy little items around you that pull you away from prayer, that pull you away from meditating on the Word of God. Sometimes you need to do a fast of electronics. Sometimes you do a fast of food, and actually there is intermittent fasting that I practice now more than, than I've ever had before, where I go long periods without eating. I might eat something like last night. I had something to eat. I had some crackers and a little bit of cheese, some healthy cheese, I thought it was, um, around 7, 30, 8 o'clock after dinner and watched a little TV, but I didn't eat anything after that. Now, this is 13, 14 hours later. I've already slept and worked out and did a walk with the dog and everything, and I'm still not hungry right now. I'm going to wait till later on to eat. Fasting itself is very biblical, but you have to understand it's not about your flesh. So what is he saying? The fast he's talking about is when I'm taken away, there'll be time for you to contemplate, 
Remove all the garbage and focus on the plan of God, is what he's saying. Jesus is using the example of a groom in reference to himself here. You can't dance around that. He's referencing himself. He will be taken away. He will ascend. As you know, it's historic. At this point, he had not. He also uses the term attendance. Notice the term attendance he uses there, pointing to everyone in view at that moment of time. He's speaking to all of them. Why didn't he tell them right there that were with him at that point right then and say, well, you guys are all my bride. Maybe he's speaking to a little bit larger of a crowd. Who's he saying? Attendance. Pointing to everyone in view at that moment of time. This is the end period. Think about this. This is the end period of the interruption of the dispensation of Israel. It's about to happen. The interruption of Israel is about to happen. The insertion dispensation of the church age is right around the corner. That's why he states this in this manner. That's why he states this in, in this manner. It was about to be a church age dispensation opening up at the cross. Now, on the day of Pentecost, it really ignited. It started. But the cross put the interruption, put the brakes on of the, of the of dispensation of Israel, nation of Israel. And it opened up the church age, which happened. There was a little intermission there, but it happened on the day of Pentecost. So it was about to be the church age dispensation opening up at the cross. Hadn't happened yet. Jesus is stating that his presence as a groom can be enjoyed by all believers. Every time period, every dispensation. The bride herself is not introduced at this point in time. The bride herself is not introduced at this point in time. I find that interesting. A lot of little details people don't look at, but that's what a pastor teacher is supposed to do. Look at the uh, theology and see where God the Holy Spirit leads them. Doesn't bring up the bride, does he? But he says the attendants, which would mean believers during this time period, of any time period. What did the uh, John the uh, Baptist say about the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ during his own ministry? These are very prophetic uh, uh, scriptures. If you understand these, these point to what is to come, what has already happened. It highlights the doctrine of dispensation as well. What, do, what did John the Baptist say? Look at this. John the Baptist, his words, not mine. John 3, 28. You yourselves are my witnesses, John the Baptist says, that I said, I'm not the Christ. I'm not the Messiah. Many approached him thinking he was. He's saying, I'm not. I told you that. But I have been sent ahead of him. He's still part of, 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 of the nation of Israel. You think about it, dispensation of Israel. I've been sent ahead of him, verse 29. He who has the bride is the groom. Pretty prophetic saying. He who has the bride is the groom. You have to pick up on these and pay attention to these folks. Nothing in the Bible should be glazed over. It's not haphazard. Every T that was crossed, every I that is dotted is very deep. In fact, like I tell you all the time, if it's related to prophecy, it has layers. He who has, has the bride is the groom, but the friend of the groom, meaning himself, who stands and listens to him, I've heard his message, I believe in him, rejoices greatly because of the groom's voice, so this joy of mine has been made full. You cannot ignore these scriptures, folks. John the Baptist was the last, I told you before, in theology. This doesn't come from Pastor Rick. It does not originate with me. I don't invent the wheel. I just use it, as they say. This is in deep theology. John the Baptist was the last Old Testament prophet. When I tell you dispensations are all over the Bible, they are. The church age dispensation began after the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross of Jesus Christ was like the big period at the end of the sentence. Slam down. That's done. Something is about to interrupt this age of Israel, the dispensation. This is why it is vital to understand why Jesus and John the Baptist made these types of statements. If it's written down, anytime you see something, you can assume this. Again, this doesn't originate with me. You can assume anytime you see something written down that is quotations, John the Baptist, Paul, Jesus, saying this, it meant it was probably a habitual thing he said in different times and different terms. 
So we can assume John the Baptist said this several times in different ways. We can assume Jesus brought up the analogy of the attendants and him being the groom. And the groom's going to be taken away more than once. This is why it's vital to understand why Jesus and John the Baptist made these type of statements. John the Baptist understood what was about to occur. He was very, very well schooled, John the Baptist, on prophecy, the Old Testament, and what was about to happen. Now in Ephesians chapter 5, we see the Apostle Paul was able to dive deeper into mystery doctrine. You guys are going to Ephesians 5. Paul had personally stayed in Ephesus early in his ministry for about three years, and this was written, many of you know, later on one of his prison epistles. It's part of his prison epistles, and it was what you call a circular letter. Paul had several of those circular letters. A lot of the letters in the New Testament were considered circular letters. They were supposed to go to several churches, which tells us it's for all of us. The whole Bible is for all of us. But the circular analogy really is a big push for everybody. Get this out to everybody. To be read at several churches. A teaching tool for the plan of God in this new church age dispensation. So all of this is teaching tools for the church age dispensation that had opened up. Ephesians 5.22. Pick it up at verse 22. Ephesians 5.22. Now be objective and not subjective. We're going to touch on something quickly with marriage. But I want you to not... To, you can think of earthly marriage. If you're married, think of earthly marriage, Christian marriage. How it's supposed to be. And then think of your marriage with Christ, because that's the analogy. But also, realize, most of us, because we're flawed creatures living in a flawed system, don't always get our marriage right. <laughs> so don't get, don't get subjective, be objective. Ephesians 5.22, wives, subject yourselves to your own husband as to the Lord. Now, this is written in a Greek present tense, speaking to a continued attitude of subordination. No, I didn't say insubordination. I said with an S, subordination. Supporting the authority above you. Yes, the man is the head of household in the temple, but that man has to be Christ-like in his leadership. He answers to God. The term your own husband in verse 22 really points to a singular man in the Greek context. Very definitive. Ladies, this means your very own husband is the right one and the authority. Stop assuming, I can tell you right now, if you're a Christian, stop assuming that if your problem's in your marriage, maybe I'm with the wrong one. Just assume, just assume is the best way to approach it, I'm just telling you. I'm not going to tell you who's the right one or the wrong one. Just assume this is your very own husband, whether, whether you like it or not, you made that decision. The only authority over you is the right man in front of you. Just assume, ladies, this means your very own husband is the right one and the authority. Don't question it. The only other authority above the husband we know is the head, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You know that. All other men are just background noise, wives. All other men are just background noise. Now, you go to work, you got to listen to your boss, if he happens to be a man, your pastor has a authority type over you, but be very careful with that as well. All other men are just background noise, wives. There's only one. Ephesians 5.23. Now relate that to your relationship with Christ as well. For the husband is the head of the wife, matter of fact statement, as Christ also is the head of the church. Subordinate yourself to him. Remove all the other noise. Wives, and we all are wives, future wives of Christ. As Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. This comparison is now opening up. The Apostle Paul's purposely doing this. It's part of mystery doctrine. The church is the bride. She must be under his authority. Singular authority, mind of Christ, Bible doctrine. There is only one authority over the church. Jesus Christ. There's only one authority over the church. Jesus Christ. The pastor is under that authority of Jesus Christ as well. His job is not to replace your husband, lady, 
ladies, excuse me, to get all your advice from. Nor is the pastor to be your final authority, men. I'm not. The pastor is under Jesus Christ. He is the head of everything. And his job is not to replace your husband, ladies, nor is the pastor to be your final authority, men. The pastor teacher is under the authority of the word. If he's really called to be a pastor, following his calling accurately, under the authority of the word, he's called to teach. You have to grow up and absorb what God is telling you through that teaching. Is he a form of authority? Yes, like your boss at work. When you leave work, your boss doesn't follow you home and boss you around. You don't call your boss and say, well, something's going on with my husband. I got a problem with this. I want to... It's the same thing with the pastor. When he's teaching, when he's in his role as the pastor, you sit under that authority and submit to it. But the pastor is under the authority of the word. Call to teach. That's my role. You have to grow up and absorb what God is telling you through that teaching. Understand the chain of command. The church is called the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, the branch of the vine. Think about those titles. The church is called the body of Christ. You see that in scripture. The bride of Christ. I'm proving you that from last lesson into this one. And the branch of the vine, branch and vine, who is Jesus Christ, is the vine. All of these terms are to highlight a unique union the church age believers have right now. All of this is to highlight a unique union, union we have with Jesus Christ, church age union. Ephesians 5.24, but as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Old Testament saints are called the family and children of God. You can find that all over scripture. Yet never, yet never the deeper principle, intimate calling of a wife and husband in relation to the church age union specifically with Christ. It's very unique. Notice something too. Subject in everything. Verse 24. Subject in everything. Whether you're talking about earthly marriage, Christian marriage, or our marriage to Christ. Subject in everything. Ephesians 5.25. Men, here we go. Husbands, love your wives. Agape. Impersonal, unconditional, virtue love. Godly love. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. If you're a man and you're getting married or you already are married and you're constantly pounding your chest saying, I'm the boss, listen to me, you're really not. You don't understand what your role is. Husbands, loves your, love your wives. Virtue love has to come from your relationship with Christ. Just as Christ also loved the church, Watch and mimic our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, even when those who failed him, believers, how he treated them. As Christ also loved the church, gave himself up for her to submit to authority, knowing it pleases God, is much easier than laying yourself down in a Christ-like selfless manner every day. So when I hear ladies, and it pops up occasionally, hear a lady say, why is it always women have to submit to the authority? That's so hard to do. I would question, how much do you know about your Bible? How much do you know about Christian marriage? To submit to authority, knowing it pleases God, that's what it comes down to, folks. Much easier. Much easier than laying yourself down in Christ-like fashion, selfless manner, each and every day. Think about that. This is why marriage is so serious, folks. It's a serious calling, yet few really understand how God aligns the principles of Christian marriage for believers. I always emphasize the Christian marriage. Talk about marriage in the world, very different. The man has to hit maturity. That's what he's called to do. The man has to hit levels of maturity because he's called into impersonal Unconditional, godly love, virtue love, agape, that is from the nature of Christ. So men, your calling towards maturity is actually a little tad bit stronger than the ladies. You better keep moving.
The church age believer is called to respond, respond to the plan of God and submit to the mind of Christ in this temporal life. The wife is usually, not always, the wife is usually, not always, but usually in a role of a responder. Think about these things. I'll say them again. The man has to hit maturity. We're talking about Christian marriage to have success, to reflect a Christian marriage, become an, a witness in the angelic conflict. The man has to hit maturity because he is called into impersonal, unconditional, godly love that is from the nature of Christ. Habitually, day in, day out. No excuses. The church age believer is called to respond to the plan of God and submit to the mind of Christ in this temporal life. The wife is usually, not always, but usually in a role of a responder. What do I mean by that? Sometimes, ladies, you can be an aggressor. This is an adult channel. I'll leave it at that. She is also in the role of submission under the authority of the husband. She is also under the role of submission under the authority of the husband. The analogies are very easy to discern. This isn't complicated, folks. Not rocket science. So, we will not embark on a deeper set of principles of marriage in this series. I've done some of that before. I got into divorce even a year and a half ago, I think two years ago. Just note the similarities of what the Apostle Paul is teaching and try to align it with what a real good Christian marriage looks like and our relationship with Christ in the church age. Ephesians 5.26 So that he might sanctify her. If everything is going the right way, everything's being applied, the maturity is there. Submission is there. Obedience is there. Ephesians 5.26 So that Jesus Christ, he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Water of the word, really, is what it says. The church age believers set apart at salvation, many of you know that, and entered into a royal family and a marriage contract which has never occurred in prior dispensations. This contract, the royal family, we can say children and family in the Old Testament, you see a lot of that in other dispensations, but you don't see a royal family. You don't see this marriage contract. Never occurred in another dispensation. Forty grace gifts are bestowed at salvation. Many of you know that. It's imputed to you. You can't deny it. You can't stop it. It just happens at the moment of salvation. Forty grace gifts. The washing is at salvation and habitually thereafter by the word. The washing begins the bath. Many of you know the reference. Last Supper, Jesus Christ said, I only need to wash your feet. You guys have bathed salvation already. The washing is at salvation, the initial bath. And habitually thereafter, by the word, the mind of Christ is the only cleansing agent against sin, sin and evil. The mind of Christ is the cleansing agent. When you submit yourself to the mind of Christ, you're adjusting to God's justice plan. The water of the word is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which happens at salvation. It will be the word that continues to change a believer and wash every believer. Why do you think I always read, in the beginning was the Word? The Word was with God, the Word was God. There's nothing more important than the Word. There's no music ministry, there's no outreach program, there's no evangel evangel obviously uh, evangelist ministries are important to bring unbelievers, but I'm telling you, for a believer, the Word, nothing more important than the Word. In fact, you can't get born again and saved without the accuracy of the gospel, the word. The water of the word is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which happens at salvation. It will be the word that continues to change a believer and wash every believer. Ephesians 5.27. Speaking about Jesus Christ, the future bridegroom. That he might present. Notice how it says he may and might. We have to make a positive decision. The bride has to be positive about who her authority is. Verse 27, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but 
that she would be holy and blameless. Christ is our groom. Christ is our groom, whom we have entered into a covenant of marriage with that salvation. Now, if you know anything about the ancient ritual of marriage, certainly when you, you study the nation of Israel, but it really was a lot of cultures did it the same way. The moment that man said, I'm going to give a gift or a sacrifice and go to the father and go to the family and give a sacrifice for that girl, she's going to be my bride. At that moment, there's already a covenant and an agreement there. It's already the, the marriage. You, can't, you, they, you weren't supposed to back out of it from that point. So that was almost like a marriage covenant agreement right there. Nowadays, we slip a ring on the finger and say, yeah, I'll marry you next year. Then we'll be married. But no, when you slip the ring on the finger in the ancient world, even though that wasn't how they often wore a ring. A lot of times the women would wear a ring on a, on a necklace. Lesson for another day. <laughs> but how it happened was the engagement, we would say. What we look at as the engagement was the marriage contract. And in fact, when that, when that groom finally came to get the bride and he crossed the, crossed the threshold back into the family's household and the father handed the daughter's uh, hand, arm, over to that groom, that was considered married as well. That was the ceremony. The rest of it was a party. Christ is our groom, whom we have entered into a covenant of marriage with at salvation. Yes, you're waiting for your wedding party, but you're already married legally, we would say. We've already entered the contract. Ephesians 5.28. So husbands also ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. This is why it's important to have confidence and self-love in a healthy way, because then you can be confident and love others. So husbands also ought to own, love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. And there's nothing wrong with that. The Word of God teaches us we should love ourselves in a good way, in a healthy way. Again, a lesson for another day. Some people have narcissistic attitudes about self-love which is evil. Again, we see a Greek present tense in verse 28. Greek present tense. You guys know this. Husbands keep on. Like the wife has to keep on submitting. Husbands keep on loving your wife no matter what. With virtue love. You have to be able to switch between personal and impersonal. The Apostle Paul is masterful here in weaving these concepts of Christian marriage and our relationship to Christ in marriage into an incredible, powerful message here. Very incredible, powerful part of mystery doctrine. Ephesians 5.29, For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. You don't reject and hurt yourself. You don't put yourself in a position where you could be hurt badly. If you do, you have a lot of issues. We have people that do these stupid things because maybe they don't love themselves enough, respect their own life enough. But those who have common sense, good Christians, don't put themselves in positions of jeopardy all the time, and they try to remain healthy and take care of themselves. They have to do that for their wife as well. Now, we in the church age are taken care of by Jesus Christ. We just simply need to be positive. Ephesians 5.30, because we are parts of his body. He wants to nurture us and take care of us. We have to be positive, just like a wife. You can't force a wife to submit to you, man. If you are, you're in trouble. If you are, you're in trouble. She has to willingly submit. We have to take our free will and willingly submit. Christ has a unique relationship with church-age believers. There's no way getting around it as part of his body as a bride. Why is it related like that? As a bride becomes one with the groom. Again, this is an adult channel. So there's a lot of ways that a bride and groom become one. Obviously, there's physical in the bedroom. But there is also a matching and merging of everything in their life. As a bride becomes one with the groom, there's nowhere, nowhere in the Old Testament we see this level of intimacy offered with Christ. No other dispensation. That's why we call the church age unique. Every dispensation is unique and special in its own way for certain things that happen. This is our specialty, our uniqueness, church age. It's under the mystery doctrine umbrella. Ephesians 5.31, for this reason, 
Paul's now quoting the word of God from the beginning, the garden. For this reason, a man shall leave his wife, his mother, and be joined, cleave to his wife, which has two or three connotations. One of them in the sexual realm, can't get any more intimate than that, but the other way is everything in life. Cleave to that wife, join to this wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a command for the most intimacy of all history here. Intimacy of marriage, Christian marriage, given in Genesis chapter 2. And that's the relationship you are called into with Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5.32, this mystery over 20-something times in the New Testament, most by the Apostle Paul. This mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ in the church. How do you dance around this any other way? But I'm speaking with reference to Christ in the church. When did the church start? You don't find the church as far back. You can go back into the Exodus generation. You don't find the church. That's a dispensation. That's a new calling. Mystery doctrine is in view here. You cannot dance around it. This aspect of the mystery is related to our intimacy with Christ. This marriage analogy was never opened up. Never opened up in any other dispensation except the church age. You can find all kinds of references to children, love, and family, and all these type of things. Even some references in certain prophets that said, you know, you're like a wife that, uh, obviously, many of you know go the situation with Gomer and Hosea. But uh, the, a lot of the prophets would use the term, and God the Holy Spirit would have them use the term, you're like an unfaithful wife to me. But you don't see the marriage to Christ like this, defined like this, with this level of intimacy. You do not see this in any other dispensation. Because of this mystery, we now understand how the groom returns for his bride, and we have a future wedding ceremony. Because of this mystery, mystery doctrine, this portion of it, we now understand how the groom returns for his bride, and we have a future wedding ceremony. Many of you can relate to this now if you've been with me, especially the last three or four hours of teaching. Ephesians 5.33, nevertheless, Apostle Paul goes on to write, as for you, individually, on your own walk here on earth, temporal, Christian marriage, each husband is to love his own wife the same as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Do you know anywhere in there? In fact, you can't really find it if you don't understand what I'm going to say next. Nowhere do you find in Christian marriage that you have to be always personally in love, which means that romantic and intimate love. But you always have to have impersonal, unconditional love. And you always have to have respect and honor for one another. That's what's going to hold the relationship together, folks. The two areas... Both husband and wife must understand his virtue, love, and respect. And both of them should apply it, but... Virtue, love, and respect, both should apply it, but... A successful Christian marriage is dependent upon these two, especially for the wife to honor and respect the husband, even in his failures. I honor and respect him. As long as he's good to me, I'm good to him. It's not how it works. Especially for the wife to honor and respect the husband in his failures. The reason God put it in the word of God like that about respect and honor the husband and for the husband to impersonally, unconditionally love the wife is because those are our weak areas in relationships. Ladies, you struggle to honor and respect authority when it collapses in front of you. Oh, well, that's your weak area. God's saying no excuses. Men, you struggle to have this impersonal, unconditional virtue love where you continue to take care and do the right thing for that woman when she's when she's angry towards you. You develop a bitterness or a distance with her. You're not supposed to. A successful Christian marriage is dependent on these two, especially for the wife to honor and respect the husband, even in his failures. Men, it is our call to love our wife as our own bodies, no matter what. In personal, unconditional love, to operate in virtue love, even when she may be acting unlovely. Even when she may be men acting unlovely. Oh well. Marriage is very serious, Christian marriages. Make sure you're mature enough for it. 
The bride of Christ must learn both virtue love, impersonal, unconditional love, and respect. It's interesting. Think about Christian marriage and our marriage with Christ. We are the bride in that role with Christ, all of us. The bride of Christ must learn both virtue love, impersonal, unconditional love, and respect. The key, as the wife, when we're all, we're all the future bride of Christ, the key will be respect toward what? The mind of Christ. That's what's left for us right now, the mind of Christ. If you can't respect that now in time, you're not going to respect it later on, trust me. The key will be respect toward the mind of Christ first, which leads to virtue love for him. You start buckling down and honor and respecting the word of God, and you will find that virtue love will open up very easily. This puts building blocks, what have we talked about recently? One on top of the other. This puts building blocks in place for personal love to flourish. And it works the same way in marriage. You want personal love to flourish? Get some of the other issues in line. Respect, honor, and agape love. The deeper this respect and love grows and feeds off of each other, the more your love relationship flourishes, not only in Christ, but in your temporal marriage. There's my marriage counseling for you. Cheers. $75 an hour I get. There it is. <laughs> A lot of people don't want to take it. It's not complicated. Marriage counseling is really not complicated. If you stick with the word of God, it's really, really not. But it's not what people want to hear. But I just showed you. It's not what the world wants to hear in relation to having a good marriage or bad marriage. They'll think of everything else but. Jump over to Matthew 25. Go to the Gospel of Matthew 25. We'll close in the Gospel of Matthew 25 today. So this is clearly is teaching us our earthly marriage between husband and wife is just as important and intimate as our marriage to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's what it's teaching us, church age believers. These are learned skills as well. Keep that in mind. These are learned skills. How do you learn a skill? You have to keep doing it over and over again. You fumble and fail and mess around with it and realize, oh gosh, I got to try better tomorrow in this area. I got to work on this. I got to look at that. It's a skill set. These are skill sets. The only difference is we don't do it in our flesh. We do it in a new nature with the word motivating us. These are learned skill sets. This respect and love is not going to come from just wishing or praying about it not going to come from a weekend retreat this respect and love is not going to come from just wishing and praying about it emotional personal love does not have the ability to teach you respect honor and virtue love so if you're a newlywed and you're still wrapped up in this emotional personal type of love attraction stage whatever it is emotional personal love does not have the ability it's incapable to teach you respect, honor, and virtue, love. You have to have them first. Don't get the cart before the horse. Emotions such as attraction or personal love are dependent upon feeling good, which can change every day. These are emotional waves, as I always tell you, that come and go. And with no foundation in Bible doctrine, they will fail you and fail your relationship over time. Let me say that again. There's another aspect of my marriage counseling that many will brush off in the world. Emotions such as attraction, nothing wrong with it. You need some attraction, obviously. Or personal love, they treat me good, I treat them good. They're sweet, they cook me dinner once a week, she does this, he does that. That's all, a lot of that's emotional base. Emotions such as attraction or personal love, are dependent upon feeling good. These are emotional waves that come and go. And with no foundation in Bible doctrine, they will fail you and fail your relationship over time. I don't know, six months or six years, I don't know. They will fail you. There is clear teaching, not only from Jesus about marriage, but the apostles emphasizing what they learned about mystery doctrine as well. 2 Corinthians 11, 2 and Revelation 19, 7 on the board. Two separate apostles wrote this. John and Paul. I'll read them. Hang on. 
2 Corinthians 11, 2, Mystery Doctrine. It's under the umbrella of Mystery Doctrine. For I am jealous, the Apostle Paul writes, for you with a godly jealousy, which is good, not bad. For I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. And Paul is telling them, and you guys keep going astray. You keep cheating. But what is he saying? I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin of Christ. He understands mystery doctrine, and under that umbrella is this Christian marriage of Christ and the church. Revelation 19, 7. What was John told? Let's rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him, because the marriage of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, has come. Who do you think he's marrying? The church. And his bride has prepared herself. Believers. The marriage will come. The cosmic system version of marriage, what I'm telling you about, is skewed. That's why they can't accept what I'm teaching. They can't take simple principles like you just learned in the last 15 or 20 minutes here and realize that's your marriage counsel. The cosmic system version of marriage is skewed, and in recent years, I'd say the last 20, but the last five or six, has been completely destroyed and twisted. God's design was one man, real man, one real woman, only two genders. I don't teach nonsense here. Only two genders. God's design was one man, one woman, who were pure of body, do the math, and positive toward his word. That's God's design. How often does that happen? Pure of body and positive toward the word when you get married. They come together under his authority. They wait on God's timing. And his word guide their life. How many marriages, and I'm talking Christians, come together and operate under those principles? They don't ask me why there's a problem. They come together under his authority and his word to guide their life. Anything, listen to me carefully, again, objective, not subjective, we've all failed in this area. Anything that differs from this divine design will struggle immensely to find any level of success. There's your outcome, says Dr. Rick, actually, Dr. Jesus Christ. Anything that differs from this divine design, pretty simple, will struggle immensely to find any level of success. Now, if you get married under any other circumstances and you want to turn it around and turn the curse into a blessing and get things right with God and open up all the things God has for you, then start acting and moving in a fashion that respects and honors and agape loves the word of God. The cosmic system version of marriage is skewed in recent years has been completely destroyed and twisted. God's design was one man, one woman, only two genders. Any rainbows I have are related to the promise of Noah. Sorry to tell you, that's the real rainbow. God's design was one man, one woman who were pure of body, pure of body, and positive toward his word. Then they can come together in marriage. But they come together under his authority, meaning the plan of God, his timing, and his word to guide their life. Anything that differs from this divine design will struggle immensely to find success. Levels of success, is what I'm telling you. It's not like it's impossible. You see some unbelievers in the cosmic system that have levels of success in marriage, and maybe God is giving them all their blessings now because they're not going to have any when they come face to face at the great white throne judgment. We do things our way. And the only way to turn it around is give everything over to God and fix our mistakes. Which, by the way, doesn't happen overnight. It takes time and effort and both parties participating to turn it around. And become the husband and wife God called you to be. This section of Matthew 25 we are in, we're going to look at, has a future reference to the coming tribulation. I've taught you this before. You'd have to go back a couple of years when we were finishing out Matthew. But it really, a lot of this relates to the tribulation, but there are layers here. Jesus is speaking with a reference to the second advent, yet 
There was much deeper principles at work here. It has a dual meaning. Maybe I tell you that all the time. Prophecy is very like a diamond, multifaceted. It has a dual meaning related to accepting the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as Savior before and after the rapture. Jesus is teaching about not only the church age about to open up, but the stronger highlight is during the tribulation period. But there are some church age principles in this. Let's close with the words of Pastor Rick. No. Let's close with the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ during his earthly ministry. Matthew 25, 1. Before the cross, he's teaching them, which means if he said it once, he said it a bunch of times in different ways. What did I just tell you? Matthew 25, 1. Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the groom. The bride's friends have to wait outside traditionally. They are not permitted in until the bride comes. That was an ancient tradition. The bride's friends would have to wait outside for her to come. That parade march. That was an ancient tradition. The ceremony or banquet of the wedding cannot officially begin until the wedding parade, whether it's the bride and groom by themselves or a whole bunch of people, the wedding parade arrives with the bride and groom. Cannot begin. And the friends, the close friends of the bride, weren't allowed in yet. Just telling you. Ten bridal lamps were also a common Jewish tradition for a wedding party. Isn't that interesting? Ten bridal lamps were a common Jewish tradition for a wedding party. Matthew 25, 2. Jesus speaking, five of these bridesmaids, or whatever they are, friends of the bride, were foolish. Five were prudent. Hmm, believer or unbeliever? Matthew 25, 3. For when the foolish took their lamps, they did not take, it really says oil with them. I know it says extra oil, but oil with them. The opportunities to fill your soul, lamp, soul, eye is the soul, lamp is the soul, light of the soul. All biblical analogies. The opportunities to fill your soul, your lamp with the anointing oil of God the Holy Spirit is available right now, as well as in the tribulation. If you're listening to my voice, it's not too late, in other words, to believe upon Jesus Christ. It'll be the same thing in the tribulation. So if you decide to stay an unbeliever and I'm, we are raptured up tomorrow, heed my words that in the tribulation, if you can still get up in the morning and breathe and hear and see and move around, you can believe upon Christ in the tribulation. You can put that oil, that healing anointing oil of God, the Holy Spirit, in your lamp, in your soul. The tribulation believers will become part of the family of God, yet we who are church aid believers are the bride of Christ. The tribulation believers will become part of the family of God, yet we who are church age believers are the bride of Christ. Don't forget your title. So, there is a strong analogy of the coming tribulation in all this. I can't deny it. There is also a touch of an analogy of the end of the church age as well. As most times within prophecy, there's several layers for us to learn from. God kind of writes it like that, amen? Lots of things to peel back and look at. Matthew 25, 4, But the prudent ones took oil in the flask with their lamps. They're prepared. They're already believers. Oil in Scripture, many of you know, I've covered this principle. It's pretty easy to find. Oil in Scripture is often used for healing and anointing. And who is the reference for oil that heals and anoints in Scripture? God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is sometimes the reference for anointing oil in Scripture. That's what you're looking at. The lesson within this for both the current dispensation of the church age right now or the coming tribulation period is that we have to have the baptism of God the Holy Spirit. One time event. Faith alone and Christ alone. That's your altar call. It's not about water. It's not about tongues. It's not about confessing to a priest. It's about having faith alone in Christ alone. You know you're a sinner. You look to Christ. Think about the, the, the thief on the cross. It's written for our benefit. You know you're a sinner. You look to Christ as your Savior. That's it. One way. 
The lesson within this for the both the current dispensation of the church age or the tribulation period is that we have to have the baptism of God, the Holy Spirit, which is like that. Faith alone in Christ alone, the baptism of God, the Holy Spirit. Without that, we are never entering into a wedding ceremony with Christ in any age, any dispensation. Without that, we are never entering into a wedding ceremony, a wedding party, a royal family, any type of family setting with Christ in any age, any dispensation. You're going to be on the outside looking in. Not pretty. Matthew 25, 5. Now, while the groom was delaying, interesting analogy, they all became drowsy and began to sleep. Verse 6, Matthew 25, 6. But at midnight, there finally was a shout. This is interesting too. Behold the groom. Come out to meet him. The time for both the rapture and the second advent will not be available for a human viewpoint to pinpoint and make assumptions about. Well, I know now I learned from you, Pastor Rick, that the tribulation is seven years. So I'm going to tell you a little hint about the tribulation, something I believe, my personal studies. Because we don't know the exact time or date of the rapture or the second advent, the tribulation period on God's timetable could begin two days, a day, or the moment, or a week, or a month after the rapture of the church, I believe. That way, you're not going to be able to look for a time clock in the tribulation and say, well, the rapture happened on this exact date, this exact time, so I know exactly when Christ comes back to the second advent. You do not. The time for both the rapture and the second advent will not be available for human viewpoint to pinpoint and make assumptions about. Don't play games. Don't play games with the plan of God. The shout comes from the pulpit here. That's what this is about. Accurately handling the word of God. That's your wake-up call. Because the shout, how do I know that? Because the shout comes from someone that's intimate with the groom because they can look at the groom from a long distance away, riding on a horseback from 300 yards away and say, there he is. I know him. I'm intimate with him. The shout comes from the pulpit accurately handling the word of God. That's your wake-up call. That's your wake-up call. So you better get into the word is what I'm telling you. Matthew 25, 7. Then all those virgins got up and trimmed their lamps. They're preparing now. The lamps represent what we put in our soul structure. Remember that. You cannot play games with God. Again, I remind you. You cannot disregard your own personal responsibilities because the day and the time will pop up suddenly and you're going to be held accountable. The day and time will pop up suddenly and you'll be held accountable. The rapture will come and it'll be a confusing moment of time and you're stuck here. You're an unbeliever. You're here for the seven-year tribulation. You better become a believer at that point because there's no way you're going to tick off the time and say, now I know exactly when the second advent's going to come because at the end of this seven-year period, I can live like hell for the next seven years and go along and get along that I'll believe at the last moment of time. I wouldn't play games with God. Responsibility is on you because it's going to pop up suddenly and you'll be held accountable. Matthew 25, 8. But the foolish virgin said to the prudent ones, unbeliever to believer, give us some of your oil. Give me what you got. You got it looks, looks like you got something good over there because our lamps are going out. Your free will. First, One of the first things God gave us. Your free will, your freedom of thought to be who you are, your free will and responsibility will be what you will be held accountable for in the end. And that goes for believers, because we have winners and losers in heaven. Your free will, your responsibility will be what you're held accountable for in the end. Whether you're at the BBC judgment of Christ and you realize, boy, I don't have any crowns, blessings, and rewards, I kind of shy away from that. Everybody else here is throwing their crowns and blessings at the Lord's feet, and they're going to have all kinds of authority in heaven. At least I'm in heaven. But you're going to be held accountable either way. For an unbeliever, it's even worse than that. Amen? 
either at the time of the rapture or the end of the tribulation. No one is responsible for your free will decisions, folks, except you. No one is responsible for your free will decisions except you. Matthew 25, 9. However, the prudent ones answer no. I love it. There must most certainly would not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the merchants, buy some for yourselves. Go figure it out. It's on you. Time is up. It comes down to our own responsibility. Even in marriage, a wife or husband cannot force the other spouse to believe upon the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You cannot. Or even push them, if they're a believer, to grow in his grace and knowledge. You cannot. It all comes down to our own free will decisions, our own responsibility, folks. Matthew 25, 10. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, go figure out exactly what's going on. Because they never came to believe. The groom came, and those who were ready went with him. So suddenly. Didn't think he was going to make that march over here so quickly. And those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast. They were invited like part of the family. And the door was shut. See that last part that says the door was shut? Unfortunately, for a lot of people, there's going to come a time. Maybe they'll be laying in a hospital bed. I don't know what it will be. The door will be shut. Maybe it will be a rapture or the end of the seven-year tribulation. The door will be shut. There will be a definitive finality both at the rapture of the church and the end of the tribulation. Beginning, middle, and end to everything in this temporal life. Trust me when I tell you. There will be a definitive finality both at the rapture of the church and the end of the tribulation. Matthew 25, 11. This is a very hard statement. That Matthew 25, 10, very hard statement. A lot of people don't like when the word of God's a little bit harsh. Matthew 25, 11. Yet later, the other virgins also came saying, Lord, Lord, open up. Don't you know me? Sound familiar? Matthew 25, 12. But he answered, truly I say to you, I don't know who you are. Doesn't even open the door. Matthew 25, 13, be on the alert. Be on the alert then because you do not know the day nor the hour. Don't assume you do, rapture or tribulation. No pastor, theologian, or scholar, let me say this again. No pastor, theologian, or scholar knows exact times, dates, and relation to end time events. None. None. And I know a lot of people hold certain men up really, really high, almost like little deities. I'd be careful if I were you. No pastor, a theologian, or scholar knows exact times and dates in relation to end time events. In fact, a lot of aspects of the end times are a little bit wide open. In fact, several details in relation to end time events are not available for human consumption. But this one pastor or this one prophet or this one guy that taught for 40 years, he knows everything about God. He can tell me exactly this, this, and this. Okay. Okay. I can give you a nice template and a nice overview of exact things, but I can tell you there's a lot of little times, details, and people, and things in that are what I would say minute details that are very tricky that are going to be in there that people think they know and they do not know. I would say just be ready. How about become a bride of Christ now? And he's got it covered. Amen. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. Father, bless this message. Take it out to a lost and dying world. Through your son's precious name. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.